Um, OK, hello. Hey, guys, so let's get started uh, with the next session. Yeah, let's get started. OK, so I'm uh, um, Matei. I'm a fifth year grad student here, going into my sixth year now, uh, which is also my last year, I've been promised. And um, <laughs> this is, yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, you know, one, one of the students who, who started uh, the Spark project. So in the rest of this morning, I'm going to talk to you about parallel programming in Spark and using this system to do, um, you know, parallel programming on clusters, both in the way that you can do today with MapReduce, but also with the new primitives for in-memory computing that we've developed over here. And the goal of this is that by the end of this, um, you'll, you'll have a sense of how to use Spark both to look at data interactively very quickly um, and to write standalone programs that use it. Um, so I'm going to, to start with just a very quick overview of what Spark is, and then I'll dive into uh, how we can actually use it uh, to do stuff. Um, and I'll have kind of two halves to this talk. The first one is just going to be using it interactively at the console to just look inside data. Okay. Um, so, so Spark um, is a, a cluster computing system uh, that's designed to be fast. Uh, it's designed to be faster than the state of the art in many sort of uh, relevant applications. It's designed to be expressive, so it's supposed to be general, so you can use it for a lot of applications and um, a high level so that you don't have to write a lot of code to get stuff done. Um, and it's designed to be compatible with Apache Hadoop. So really at the core of the system, it tries to build on the Hadoop interfaces uh, to, uh, to, to talk with storage systems in the same way that Hadoop does so that you can just plug it into an environment that's running Hadoop and passes the same data. Um, so in particular, if you have a Hadoop supported storage system, so something like HDFS or HBase or Amazon S3 um, or a storage format, you can just read that format directly using Spark. The, apart from this, they don't share any kind of code base, but this part, we just use the same interfaces so you get the same data. And so the things it adds on top of MapReduce are twofold. So first, for efficiency, it adds these primitives for in-memory computing. And Jan motivated to you why we think this is important. Um, and uh, using these primitives, we've actually gone in substantial speed ups already in sort of real world applications. Um, the second thing it adds is it supports more general computation graphs than MapReduce. I'll explain why that's useful later, and we'll see some examples. But basically, um, if you have an application with multiple stages, you can run those all as one graph. You don't have to like, stop between each pair of map and reduce functions. So using these things, we've managed to go um, as much as 30 times faster than uh, solutions based on Hadoop in, in sort of real applications. And there are people who've deployed this and you know, seen this for real applications. Um, the second thing it does is to try to really improve usability, to make it much faster to write programs for clusters. And this is done through some rich APIs in the Scala programming language and Java, um, and uh, also through having an interactive shell where you can just use the system at the command line and run queries on top of a cluster. And as a result of this, you can often write a factor of two to 10 less code as well. And we've had users tell us, you know, we switched actually just because it was easier to program. You know, we don't care as much about the speed, but we wanted to prototype applications quickly. Um, all right. In terms of how to actually execute it, you know, in, in practice, um, Spark tries to be uh, relatively easy to, uh, to, to get started with and run. Um, so first of all, if you can run it uh, on just on your laptop in what's called local mode, where it just uses the multi-core processor on your machine, so it can still run in parallel, but only with that many cores. And the way you do that, you just add this library to your program, and then you're set, you can use it, and it will run. Um, if you want to run on Amazon EC2, we provide a set of scripts that make it very easy to launch a Spark cluster. So these scripts will set up uh, Spark, they'll set up Mesos underneath to actually manage the resources, they'll set up a Hadoop file system for you, and in about five minutes you go from telling how many nodes you want to having that many nodes running. And finally, for a private cluster, um, right now you can deploy Spark on top of Mesos. We have um, you know, a bunch of uh, ways to do that. Um, but we're also working on uh, running it on top of Yarn, which is a project in Hadoop. It's the next generation cluster manager that's part of the Hadoop stack, um, and also a standalone deploy mode. Uh, these are both available in the development branches of Spark. They're not released yet, but they'll be in the next release. And of course, if you want to play with them, you can try them out before too. 
And let me just say uh, one word about the, uh, the Scala and uh, Java interfaces. So Spark, if you've heard about it before, you've probably seen it in Scala. It was developed in Scala, and we really chose the language because it made it possible to write very uh, concise code to do uh, functional programming like MapReduce uh, over a cluster, and because it made it possible to do interactive use. Um, but we recently added a Java API as well that's in the development branch, and you'll actually be able to play with that today at the exercises if you prefer to use Java. Um, the shell will still be in Scala, but the languages are also close enough that most of the things you know from Java you can use directly in Scala. So in, in this course, we'll mostly be showing stuff in Scala, and I'll show the translations to Java in places where it makes sense, uh, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll go uh, with that. So I'm gonna start in this talk. Uh, the goal of this talk is to just show you how to use Spark at the console. And by the end of the talk, we want you to be able to actually fire up um, a cluster and start asking questions about data sets from the Scala console. So I'm gonna start this with just an introduction to Scala and to functional programming concepts that Spark builds on. And then I'll show you what, what Spark is actually about, what the main ideas are, and give you a tour of the operations available in there. And finally, I'll end with a, a bit on job execution. Um, after that, uh, I'm going to have a second talk um, after, which will be about writing standalone programs. So that will show you, okay, like now I've explored some data at the console, how do I do something standalone? So let's just start with this. Um, so I'm gonna start by just covering Scala first because basically a, a lot of the things you can do in Scala translate directly into Spark and is the same concepts. Um, so if you haven't um, heard of Scala, uh, it's a high level language for the Java VM. What that means is just that it compiles to JVM bytecode and it can call into Java and basically you know, Scala objects map to Java objects and so on. And uh, what it provides is object oriented programming plus functional programming, uh, which is, is the thing that we're excited about for actually making it easy to write uh, parallel programs. Um, so a few things you should know about it. Um, the first one is that it's statically typed. So it means you know, the, the, variable of, the type of each variable is known and the compiler can optimize for that. Like you know, if you have ints, it can do integer arithmetic, stuff like that. Um, and so that means the speed is comparable to Java or C Sharp or these other languages that are statically typed. But at the same time, it makes extensive use of type inference, which means that in a lot of places you don't have to specify the type and the compiler will figure it out for you. So you write code that at first looks a lot like a dynamic language such as Python. Um, the language also interoperates with Java, and in particular, uh, you can call into any Java libraries or classes you have. You can inherit from a Java interface, you know, implement it, um, and you can also call the other way around. So from Java, you can see Scala classes and call into them and, you know, extend them and stuff like that. And the best way to learn the language is through the interactive shell. Um, so that's what I'll be showing. Um, and this is, you know, an interpreter much like the Python interpreter that supports all the language features and lets you try them out uh, interactively. Okay. Um, so let's, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to just start that up over here. Um, and this is all you, you type in Scala. So, okay. Um, so the first thing we're gonna look at um, here is how do you declare variables and functions? Okay, let me just make that one big for, uh, for now. Yeah, so, um, so this is basically in this thing, I'm, I'm only going to cover a very quick tour of the language. I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but these are just the basics you need to know to use it. Um, so first, declaring variables. There are two ways to declare them. There's var and val. And basically var is a, is a mutable variable. It's one you can change the value of later. Val is immutable, so it's like a final in Java. And uh, the language really um, encourages the use of val and of immutable uh, data types. Um, it's just very natural to do that um, in, in this kind of functional language. It makes code easier to reason about, and in particular, it makes parallelism easier to worry about because you don't have race conditions. Because you know, once you create a variable, it, it stays at that value. Um, and one of the things you'll notice here is the, the way you specify the type is uh, after the variable with a colon, and you can also remove the type, and then the compiler will infer the type of that variable for you. Um, so often you, you won't ever see types in a variable declaration in Scala. Um, so let me just show that in here. Uh, 
So, you know, for example, I can do var x equals seven, um, and it will tell me x is an int. Um, you know, I can do x minus six, it works, okay? Uh, if I did y equals pi, uh, and then I did y minus six, it wouldn't work. Um, so it's, you know, it, it does know the types. Uh, and similarly, I can't do stuff like y equals six because that's an int and f1 is a string. Okay, um, the other thing is um, functions. Um, I don't know if it's useful to switch to this this quickly because it takes a while for the projector to, to come up, um, but let's, let's try. Okay, so functions, you can create them using def um, and um, there's different expressions. One of the things about Scala is it really encourages the use of smaller functions. Um, so you can just uh, have, uh, uh, for example, if the function only returns one statement, you can just put that after an equal sign and you don't have to worry um, about having curly braces and stuff. So this here at the top is the shortest syntax. Um, if you want to have a block of statements, you can just put in curly braces and the last expression in it is returned. Uh, you can also use a return statement if you want, but this is more concise in, in some cases. Um, and finally, if you have a void function, like the one at the bottom here, you just uh, put the curly brace right after the parentheses. You don't put a return type. Um, so, so that's a void function. Okay. Um, the other thing I wanna show is working with generic types because we'll have to do some of this. Um, so um, in Scala, the, the uh, type uh, parameters for generic type are in square brackets. Um, and also all the generic types, including arrays and list and stuff like that are, are unified so, so they have the same syntax. Um, so here, if we wanted to create an array of int, uh, this would be kind of like having angle brackets around the int in Java, but it's square brackets here. Um, so, you know, create an int array. Um, if you wanna create a list, uh, one of the easiest ways to create a list is just to write list and then in parentheses the numbers in it. Um, and uh, this, uh, this thing here is basically a factory method that you're calling that will give you back a list of int. And then indexing is also kind of homogenous. It's always using, uh, you know, round parentheses. So we see here if we're indexing inside the array. Um, and all these things are where the, the type safety carries through all these things. So you can't add a string to a list of ints and stuff like that. Okay. Um, the other uh, thing you may notice here is, you know, in Java, these, these uh, templated uh, 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 kind of data structures can't hold primitive types. In Scala, you know, every type can be put in every data structure as well. Okay. But so, so the interesting thing is, um, how do we actually do functional programming? Um, so uh, in Scala, uh, functional programming means that functions are uh, first class uh, primitive. So there are things you can pass around between methods in your program and uh, just you, you can have a function that takes another function, you can apply it in a bunch of places and so on. And there's syntax for defining these functions in place. This is a lot like using a lambda in Python or uh, a block in Ruby or stuff like that. Um, so for example, list has a method called for each that you pass a function and it applies that function on each element. And these are these things in, in uh, red here are gonna be uh, function expressions, uh, also called closures. Um, so the longer form is uh, here, it's like uh, you give an argument name and then what do you wanna do with that argument? Um, the shorter thing, if you just wanna apply one function to it, you can just put the name of that. So this is, you know, this is going to print each element in the list. Um, a other common method that you use on list is map. So map takes each element of the list and passes it through a, a function. Um, so here, for example, we're adding two to each element and we have both the long syntax at the top and the shorter syntax is called placeholder notation, which is if you only use each argument once, you can just put an underscore in there. So this underscore plus two means take the first argument and add two to it. It's exactly the same as what's above. Um, and finally, um, you, you can do other things. So filter, for example, will keep only the elements matching a predicate. So you give it a Boolean function. This one here keeps all, only the odd numbers. Um, reduce is something that takes a two argument function. So there's the syntax for a two argument function at the bottom. Um, and then there's also, um, if you have two argument functions and you only use each one once, you can, do, uh, you can use the placeholder notation there. Um, and so hopefully this gives you a sense of what's going on in there. 
and all of these um, leave the list uh, unchanged. So one of the things you should notice about this is each method returns a new list. And this makes it easy to, to reason about the program again because you're not modifying the list in place. So that's, that's a key aspect of making this style of programming work well. Okay. Um, and just to, to recap this, uh, I wanted to have a slide on just showing different versions of the closure syntax because you'll be using this a lot. Uh, so you can have uh, something I hadn't shown before is the full version. If you want, you can specify the types of the arguments. Um, you, you've seen these ones here with placeholder notation. If you want, you can have a block and you just have a curly braces and then the last thing in it is what the function returns. Um, and of course, if it gets um, too, uh, too complicated to write all the functions in line, you can always define a method and then call that method. And, and one of the nice things is you can even do this inside another function. You can define sort of a nested function and go with that. So hopefully this has given you uh, some, some idea of how this works. Uh, let, let me know, by the way, if there are any questions uh, you know, at any point, uh, because next we'll be going through how to do the stuff in Spark. Yeah. Can you have named closure? Uh, what do you mean by that? Oh yeah, you can have a variable which points to a, a function, yeah. Uh, yeah, and you can also pass a method which as a, every place you can pass a function, like you can pass a method of the current object, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you try to change the method every time? Oh, I think it's hard, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, that's true, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to help the webcast to move the podium. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so hopefully this has given you an idea. If you're curious to see more, you can look at the Scala documentation for some of these methods. So for example, seek or seq is the, is the parent of, of uh, all the sequence collections in Scala, including arrays and lists. And um, if you look at it, it has all kinds of interesting methods. Uh, so we've seen map and filter. It also has stuff like group by and sort or exist, um, you know, all these kinds of things. Okay. So let's see how, how this applies in um, Spark then. Um, so in, in a nutshell, uh, the, the goal of Spark is to let you work with distributed collections of elements across a cluster the same way you would with these local ones. So all the code that I showed before with maps and filters and things like that, uh, if you apply it on a distributed collection in Spark, it will do the same computation in parallel over the cluster and produce that result in parallel. And that's, that's really what there is to it. So it's just things to enable you to do this in an efficient way. And um, the concept we have that allows this is called resilient uh, distributed data sets or RDDs. This is what we call our distributed collections. And uh, they have a few um, interesting properties. So they're just collections of objects that are spread out across your cluster, across the nodes. And they're also immutable like the lists that we saw before. So you, you can't modify them after creating them. Um, they're built through these parallel transformations, like the operations I showed before, map and filter. We provide a wide array of transformations, I think about 20 or 30 in total, that let you build these things. Um, and they also automatically recover lost data on failure. So that's where kind of the magic in Spark is, is that we know how to efficiently recover any piece of a collection that is lost because of a node crashing or stuff like that. And finally, um, unlike sort of disk-based systems such as Hadoop MapReduce, you get to control the persistent setting for each collection. So you can choose, for example, to keep some of these collections in memory, which we call caching. And this is what you use in your program to keep the data that you're gonna access often in a place where you can access it quickly. So the main primitives you'll work with are these RDDs, the distributed collections. Um, which are these you know, partition collections of objects. Uh, the transformations I mentioned before, uh, one thing you'll quickly see about these is that they're all lazy, so they don't, when you do a map, it doesn't immediately run and say like, oh look, I, I mapped it, where should I put the data? It just waits until you, so you, until you chain a few other operations after it, and then there's a different set for actually computing the data at the end. Um, and finally, there's actions. These are things that return a result to the program or actually write it out. So these are the things that kick off a computation and make all the lazy stuff actually execute. Okay. 
So I'll just show this through an example of um, you know, using Spark to, uh, to look inside some log files. And this is actual code you could type in at the Scala console. And this is you know, one of the ways people actually use Spark to, to explore data. Uh, so we have basically the story is you have you know, a super successful web application and it's so successful that nothing is working and you're just getting these like hundreds of gigabytes of logs because there are too many users on the site. So you're going to search for some error patterns in the logs. So we're gonna have a cluster here. Basically, there's the driver, which is kind of the master um, of where you're running your code um, and there's a bunch of workers. And the first thing you, you'll type at the console is this. So uh, lines equals spark.txt file, and you can give it a path in HDFS. So this gives you an RDD, a distributed data set, that represents the lines of text in that file. It doesn't actually load them or anything, but it just says, you know, th these are the lines of text. Okay. Next, you can do operations as we showed before. So filter, for example, pick all the lines that start with error. And this gives you a transformed RDD that, um, that uh, knows that, okay, if I filter the file, I'll get this data. Um, you can do more things. So for example, in the log file, maybe the tab separated fields and we want tab number two, uh, we want field number two, which is the actual error message. So here we're splitting each one by tabs and then we're indexing, we get an array, we look at element number two, that's the message. Um, and finally, you can tell the system to cache some of these RDDs. So maybe we, we don't want to cache the whole file, maybe it's too big, but we do want to cache the error messages because we'll be asking many queries about them. Okay, so at this point, nothing's actually happened on the cluster, but Spark knows that these operations were chained together this way. Um, the other thing you can do is call a method. So here we're gonna do another filter. We're gonna see which of the methods contain foo, and, and we're calling count. So sorry, count is an action. Um, and actions, you know, count has to return an integer, so it has to kick off the computation right there. And what Spark will do at this point is come up with a good query plan to run this computation and actually run it on the cluster. So it will look at where the data is sitting on the nodes and uh, you know, ask HDFS about that. And it will send tasks to the nodes trying to maximize data locality. Um, and then each node will process its block and send back some results. Um, and the other thing is that each node will build in memory um, uh, the cached messages that it's constructed along the way. So whenever it computes an RDD uh, partition for a thing that should be cached, it, it just remembers that. So next time you do a query, um, for example, maybe foo wasn't the problem, you search for a bar, uh, the scheduler is gonna know that this data is cached, is going to send the data based on memory locality this time, um, and each, thing will, each machine will process the cached data and give you back the results. And often this, this happens a lot quicker. Um, so just to give you a sense, uh, one of the, the uh, tests we did is a full text search on Wikipedia, which is about 50 gigabytes of data. Um, and um, if we run it on 20 uh, EC2 machines. And if you do this with Hadoop or if you do it with on-disk data and Spark, it takes about 20 uh, seconds. If you do it with in-memory data, it takes less than a second. Um, and this is really, you know, as Jan was saying, this is the speed difference between memory and disk, and this is why it's just crucial if you want a fast application to choose which resource you're using for each data set appropriately. Um, we've also scaled this up sort of for fun, so we, we ran a one, one terabyte data set on 100 machines, and there if you run you know, Hadoop job or just uh, Spark on, the, on disk data, it takes about three minutes. If you run within memory data, it takes about five seconds. So it, it scales up as well. Okay. Uh, so so that's, that's kind of in a nutshell what Spark lets you do. Yeah, question. Oh yeah, so when you say you want to cache an RDD, are the resulting ones cached? The answer is no, so, so only the one you, you put cache on is cached. So here, like when we do the filter, we have to go scan through it again to find the ones that uh, contain foo. Yeah, other question? Uh, so, so with that HDFS URL, uh, uh -huh. are you talking about like a single file of HDFS or is there a way to query multiple files? Oh yeah. It, so is there a way to query multiple files in HDFS? There is, you can actually put a wildcard pattern in there, so the same way you would in, uh, in Hadoop, and you can also put a comma separated list of URLs, um, um, and the other thing you can do is like you can make a data set for each file and then use union, which is a way to, uh, to merge two RDDs, yeah. 
but you can use stars and stuff in, in that. Do yeah. You use like uh, to use something like input filter. Um, you just oh, I see. Yeah, I'm not sh exactly sure what that what that is, but there may uh, uh, you you can use if there's an input format for Hadoop, like if you can specify it in Hadoop, you can create that same job conf object and use it here. Yeah. Yeah. So are RDDs always in memory? Yeah, so th the answer is no, they don't have to be. So first of all, these RDDs before that we didn't call cache on, these are kind of ephemeral. So for example, if we didn't call cache and we tried to run queries on this, it would run the filter and map again each time and, and recompute that data on demand. Um, the other thing is that if you cache a, an RDD and it doesn't fit in memory, we can also spill it out to disk. And in, um, n not in the current release, but in the development branch, you also get more ways to pass arguments to cache to tell it like, oh, I want to cache this, but put it on disk, uh, or I put it in both disk and memory if you can, stuff like that. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, is it guaranteed that it will go in memory? So it's, um, if you don't have enough memory in the cluster, only part of it will make it into memory. So th the program's not, basically, it, it's not guaranteed if you don't have enough memory. Otherwise, it will try to put it. And it has, like, it does basically at least recently use the replacement on the cache when it runs out of space. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. More questions? Yeah, maybe one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so when you specify an input file, it doesn't immediately load it. It just, it just remem and it doesn't load it in memory in any case. Uh, it, it just loads it on demand that when you actually use this RDD. Yeah, there's no loading phase. So you just turn on top of existing HDFS uh, installations, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, okay, let, let me go on with, with this then. Um, so, okay, so this is kind of how you write the program. Uh, let me just talk briefly about an, another kind of cool aspect, which is the fault tolerance. Um, so because of the way we build these RDDs, like here we, we know that, okay, we took a file, we did a filter, and then a map. Um, Spark also knows how to reconstruct any data when it's lost from, um, from the memory. Um, so for example, if this piece of cache here is lost, it knows that, okay, I can take block three and do a filter and map on it again and rebuild this piece. Um, so we call this, this idea lineage, uh, the idea of remembering the, the parents that, that constructed each RDD. And uh, basically internally, Spark will represent each RDD as a graph of these transformations. And it, it knows how to efficiently recompute any piece that is lost. Um, and this is, this is a, a pretty powerful property because it means really that um, to have the in-memory data, uh, we don't have to replicate it for fault tolerance. If, if you remember from Jan Stark, replicating data over the network uh, is, goes at the speed of the network, which is 10 times slower or 100 times slower than the speed of memory. And by doing this trick, we avoid that. Um, so if you actually look at that in action, um, you know, in, in this case, we had an application, I think it was a k-means clustering that just ran many iterations over the same data. And when a machine f fails, um, you can just take the stuff that, that it had in memory and recompute it in parallel on a different set of machines and recover and go on with the computation. And often that recovery is quite fast because it's parallelized across the remaining machines. And the other element of this, which I talked about a bit in the questions, is that if the data doesn't fit in RAM, the system degrades gracefully. Um, so for example, so here we show um, running a computation from anywhere where uh, caching is completely disabled uh, to fitting only half the data in, to fitting the whole data in memory. And the performance scales down kind of smoothly between these two. So if you can fit half the data in memory, you get some speed up, uh, not everything else. And this is because we can recompute data that doesn't fit in memory, and because uh, all the operations are designed to be scan-based, so they also run fast with on-disk data. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, what's the algorithm for caching? It's actually LRU, least recently used. Uh, we're looking to make this um, easier to customize. I mean, it's not too bad to customize now, but we're looking to add stuff like priorities as well. Yeah. Okay. 
And uh, okay, so so basically, you know, um, the next thing is going to be a tour of, of the other operations beyond map and filter. Uh, just one thing I wanted to say before is give you a sense of what this looks like in Java. So if you want to do this stuff in Java, you get all the same operations, um, but you just have to use a different syntax because in Java, uh, these uh, closure expressions aren't available. Um, actually, in, in a future version of Java, they might be. So maybe you'll get to, to have a short code in there too. But basically, the way you do it is um, you make uh, an inner class that extends from function, and that, that's the thing that you pass to the method, such as filter. And um, this is kind of how, um, how the Scala code compiles internally anyway. So it fits very closely with what the Scala compiler does under the covers. So this is, you know, how if you wanted to use filter, um, I'll have more examples in, in the next stock, which is the standalone programs. Okay. So let me, um, uh, let me you know, now go into a bit more detail on the actual operations um, you can do using SPAR. So first of all, how, how would you actually try this out yourself? The easiest way to learn these is at the Spark interpreter. So, you know, as I mentioned before, you can use this stuff from a, a modified version of the Scala console. Uh, you can't do it in the normal Scala console because we had to change the interpreter a bit to make it possible to ship the code uh, over to a cluster. But you can just run Spark shell and it has the same features. Um, and the way you, you, you can run it, you, you you can tell it whether to run in local mode or connect to a cluster using this master variable. So if you have a Mesos cluster at a host endpoint, you can also connect to that. Okay. So the first thing you'll see um, in the interpreter is this uh, Spark context. This is an object that's just the main entry point to using Spark. And in Spark shell, it's created automatically for you because you need a special one. Uh, in standalone pro programs, you can just make your own. I'll, I'll cover how to do that. And then in the Spark context, um, you have a few methods to create RDDs. Um, so first of all, you can take a collection in your local program and call parallelize. That will distribute it across the, node, uh, across the nodes and give you a distributed collection. Um, second, you can also um, use uh, files in an external storage system. So text file is a convenience method for text files, um, and it supports any file system that Hadoop does. So you can use HDFS, you can use the local directory, you can also pass wildcards and stuff like that. Um, there's a more general one called Hadoop file, where if you have a Hadoop input format class, you can just pass that in, um, and uh, it, will, it will read the data the exact same way that Hadoop does. Um, and there's also stuff like sequence file uh, utility methods to work with that. So this is kind of how you make the RDDs. Um, and then you can do transformations. Um, so here are just you know, some of the transformations that we've seen before. Um, map filter, I, I've explained. Uh, flat map is one way you map each input element to, uh, to potentially zero or more output elements. So for each input element, you return a collection. And here we're returning the collection one to x, which is a syntax for a range object. So a range is just a, a special collection. It's the numbers from one up to x. So here, you know, we map one into one, we map two into one, two, and we map three into one, two, three. Um, so, so that's kind of how that works. Um, and uh, basic actions, some of the ones um, that are most commonly used are here. Um, so uh, uh, first of all, uh, collect. So collect will, will take a distributed collection and return it back to you as a local collection. Usually you do this after a filter. So this is kind of the opposite of parallelize. It just brings you back all the elements. Um, take lets you peek at the first few elements. Um, count, we saw, it just gives you a count. Um, reduce is much like the reduce on lists. Uh, it merges all the elements into one. And uh, save, there are a bunch of different save methods, but for example, save as text file writes out all the elements to a text file. And these are, you know, using, chaining these together, you can write kind of programs this, the same way you would in MapReduce. Um, so let me, um, uh, actually, let's see. Yeah, let, let me just show the next couple of things too, and then I want to actually show you this stuff in the console as well. Um, so, so this is kind of the basic operations. We've seen this so far. Um, the other kinds of operations that come in are uh, working with key value pairs. So if you look at the reduce before, it was a reduce that gives back only a single value. And that's kind of like having a, a job with a single reduce task in, in Hadoop MapReduce. So it's, you know, it's useful sometimes, but it's not a distributed reduce. 
So if you want to do a distributed reduce here where you're, say, uh, counting up things by, uh, by key, you use key value pairs. And in Scala, key value pairs are a class, tuple two, and they have this nice um, syntactic sugar, which is you can just put the elements in parentheses. And then once you make a pair, you can access the elements. They're called underscore one and underscore two. They're just fields of that, uh, of that object. So, so here are some of the things you can do with key value pairs. Um, so for example, say we had here a um, data set which is people registering their pets for you. And each person says what kind of pet they have and how many. So you know, first person has one cat, someone else has one dog, and someone else has two cats. Um, so the, the parallel version of reduce is called reduce by key, and it applies the reduction separately for each um, key, for each animal type in this case. Um, and you get you know, three cats and one dog. Um, group by key uh, gives you the actual sequence of elements. And then you can go and, and work with them. Uh, you can do a more complex function than just adding them all together. And sort by key sorts the collection um, by, by uh, you know, the, the first uh, element of each tuple. And then you know, if you save that to a file, the file would be in sorted order. Uh, something else you, people ask about is what about combiners? So the, the associative operations in Spark like reduced by key automatically implement the combiner optimization, which is like doing local aggregation on each node before shipping stuff across the cluster. So just as an example, if you wanted to do word count, which is kind of the hello world of map reduce, um, here's how you would do it. So word count, we have a bunch of lines of text and we want to end up with how many times each word occurs in the data. And so what you would do, um, there's some uh, picture below too. Um, what you would do is you first take each line of text and you use flat map to map one line into, into zero or more words. So here we're splitting it. And then so for this you, you, start, you get an RDD containing words. Uh, then you use map on that to turn each word into a key value pair, which is gonna be word comma one. And then you add up the key value pairs by key. And this is gonna do a distributed reduce. You know, all of the counts of B, for example, will end up on this node, um, and you'll, you'll get the final count. So that's kind of how it works. Okay. So let me just show you this at, um, at the console, just so we can see um, what it's like to actually do this. Um, okay. So what I have here is, uh, by the way, let me know if the text is too small or something on this. Uh, wh what I have here is an EC2 cluster um, where I've uh, set up Spark. I just launched this using the Spark EC2 script um, and I started the console. Um, and it's a 20 node cluster. I guess you, you can't really see the left edge of this. Hmm. Um, yeah. Okay, so, so it's a 20 node cluster um, and um, I actually loaded Wikipedia onto it as well uh, into HDFS. So this is the, the Spark um, shell, um, and um, you can do all the kind of st standard stuff you do in Scala here, but you also have this variable SC, which is the Spark context. So let's use that to actually ask some queries on Wikipedia. Um, so first thing I'm gonna do, uh, I'm going to create a file RDD that contains this, and I just used Control R in there to do the reverse command search, same way you can in, in uh, Bash. Um, and so, so this, is, uh, this is basically the HDFS where I loaded Wikipedia. So I have this file, and it's a tab-separated file with, uh, with each Wikipedia article in it. Um, so let's take a look at what the data uh, uh, format is. Um, sorry. So I can call first on the file to get the first element of it, um, and uh, you know, runs for a bit, and then it gives me back what the element. Okay. So, so this is a, a tab-separated file, and basically each, um, each line of the file is one article, and it has five fields. It has an article ID, um, it has a um, title, has the date when it was modified, it has some XML, and it has, you don't see the last field, but there's a plain text field as well. Um, so this was, you know, maybe the alphabetically first thing is action path. Okay, so what, what can we do with this? Um, one of the... Um, cool things you can do here is you can actually define stuff like classes and functions and use them in your parallel code. So I'm gonna actually make this easier to deal with by defining a class to represent each article. And uh, uh, this is how you define a class in Scala. It's not uh, too bad. So it's gonna be a class with two fields and no body, I just want the class. 
Um, and uh, so I have a class article. And now let's, um, let's turn this plain text into article objects to make it easier to work with. Okay, um, so I'm gonna take, uh, uh, I'm going to take each article and split it by tabs. Okay, and then I'm going to, um, it turns out some of the articles have, don't have the plain text field at the end because there's stuff like images. So I'm going to keep only the ones with five fields in the array that we've split. Um, and then I'm going to map, I have this array of five fields, let's call it A, into a new article. And I'll take field one and field four, which are the title and the plain text. This is what you can do. And you can see, obviously, it didn't just go out and do that on the cluster now. It's just remembering that I did this transformation, but I didn't actually run it. Uh, and if I want, um, I can look at the article, at the first article's title, and it's action packed. And if, if you look at this again, it's, it's kind of, it's smart, it knows that, okay, I, I only need one element, so I'm just going to compute the first partition here on your master machine and, you know, give you back the item. It doesn't have to go scan the whole file to get the first element. Um, so let, let's now do a parallel query on this. Uh, and let's just count, for example, how many of them uh, contain Berkeley, for example. And let's just count. Um, so we're, we're going to do this first before without caching the data, just to see how that happens. Uh, looks like I misspelled it. So by the way, notice the thing is actually, you know, the compiler catches these things. And it will also catch, like, um, if, you know, if you're using the hunk type in here and stuff like that. Okay, so let's run this. Um, so now it's actually going to the cluster, it's starting a bunch of nodes using mesos, and it's running these things, and you know, there's a whole bunch of output. Um, and this finish TID is where it finishes a task. So it's just going along. Okay, so, so this is kind of cool. So we were able to, to look at this data set in parallel, and it's a 50 gigabyte data set, so it is kind of big, but it, it, it takes a long time to, to scan this from, from the disk. It takes about 20 seconds, so it's not exactly interactive. Uh, so if we want to make it more interactive, we can just call cache on this guy. Uh, oops, okay. Um, and it just marks the RDD to be cache next time we use it. And so next time we run it, um, it's going to be, you know, equally slow, but it's going to add these articles into the cache. And it's actually adding just the article objects. And you can see maybe, well, somewhere in here you would see these cache entry added messages. Um, okay, and it gives you back the same answer, luckily. Um, and so if we, if we run this again on the cache data, it can get back the answer, you know, quite a bit faster. Um, so that, that's kind of how it works. Um, so, you know, since I spent a bunch of time talking about other operations, let me just show a couple of other things you can do. Um, so first, now we just counted the articles that contain Berkeley. Um, uh, let's, for example, try to get the article titles back. So the way we do that, we're gonna map them to titles and we're going to call collect. And then we get back and of course, the articles are all about the awesome research going on at Berkeley, right? So the things like people named uh, Berkeley, well, there, there's all kinds of stuff, they're not just that. Um, my favorite things here though are, there's exabyte, which is appropriate, um, and uh, there's, uh, there's history of the hippie movement, and there's list of free software lawsuits. So if, uh, <laughs> if uh, yeah, so the city has some history, you know, if you have time you can go around and look at these. Um, and, uh, okay, and let me just do one more, um, which is gonna be working with the, the key value pairs. Um, so, we did stuff with articles, let's try to do a distributed reduce too. So I'm gonna do a word count and, and then some statistics on that. Um, so, for the word count, to make it go a little faster, I'm just going to do, um, uh, I'm just going to take the words for, from the titles. And actually I'm gonna use, Oops, sorry. Uh, so I'm going to just take the title of each article and let's see how many times each article happens, you know, see what the top word is, stuff like that. Uh, so now I'm gonna map each guy to word comma one. And we can do this. Um, and maybe I'm also going to cache the counts. 
So you can see, you know, you can train all these operations, decide what you want to compute before actually computing it. And um, if we want to um, get some of the counts, uh, for example, um, let's see, um, let's get the count for the word <coughs> the. So these are key value pairs where the first guy is the. We can run that. And now it's going to go and run it. Um, and you know, it's doing this shuffle, um, and there you go. The word the occurred this many times. Um, and of course, since it's cached, if we do it again, it's gonna get it back a little bit faster. And um, you know, we can do other things. So for example, one of the operations is um, uh, sort. So let's say, we wanted, uh, let's say we wanted to sort things by the count. So we're going to map, um, and actually um, I'm gonna use a different closure syntax here, which lets you kind of pattern match on the thing in it. So here we have a word and a count, and I'm going to map it into count comma word because sort by key always sorts by the key. And then let's take the first, um, sorry, let's take the first 10 of them. Oh, interesting. Um, what does this mean? Huh, that's weird. Not many of, okay, uh, oh, I see. I think I just missed something. Let, let me try to do this um, in a different way then. Uh, huh. Okay, that's weird. Um, I think I'm just missing something. Let's let's see how I did this before. Which one? Ah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, sorry, I forgot. So sort by key takes an argument, which is, is it ascending or descending? So let's, let's false is descending. Um, yeah, so, okay. Uh, so let's just take the, you know, the top uh, 20 words this way. Um, yeah, so there you go, so this is now, Okay, so first most common one was of and then in and the and stuff like that. So yeah, so you can do this stuff. Hopefully this has given you an idea of how you can take even an unstructured data set and very quickly explore it. And of course in here you can use anything in the Java standard library and you know other Java libraries you may have. Okay, um, so let me just um, uh, finish off with, with a couple uh, more words on this. Um, and then after that, the last thing I wanna show is how to write standalone programs too. Okay, so we saw this. Um, so there's lots of other operations in Spark. Um, for example, there are a lot of the SQL operations like join and um, uh, union and stuff like that. Um, uh, w one of the ones we'll get to, we'll actually show later is the join. So I wanted to see what that looks like. Um, so if you have two data sets of key value pairs um, and you want to join on the first key, this means for, um, for each record and uh, you know in this one and this one like just take the cross product and if they have the same first key you return that um, you can do that with join so basically this gives you all pairs of elements that have the same uh, first element here um, so here we have um, uh, for for example we have a bunch of uh, visits to our website which are just url visited and ip address and we have a bunch of a second table of page names, which is the, the URL and the name of the page. Uh, and when we join them, we get a data set that has the IP address and the page name for each visit um, in the same record. And then you can do stuff like compute statistics by, by page name or stuff like that. Um, Cogroup is another one, it, maybe you've seen this in Hadoop or Pig as well. Cogroup just gives you back for each key uh, two lists, the list of elements from each data set with that key. So then you can do more complex things in there if you don't wanna just look at each pair of elements in the two uh, things um, and uh, other ones as well. Um, one other maybe, um, one, one other like practical thing you need to know is um, all these pair operations let you control the number of reduce tasks they use through a second parameter. So this is like setting the number of reduce tasks in MapReduce. And it's an optional parameter, but you can pass in um, the, the number of tasks you want. I think by default it's basic, it's eight, which is, you know, sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not. Um, you can also set this property at the bottom. 
Um, and the last thing I haven't shown yet is using local variables. So one of the, the really cool things about uh, Scala and Spark is because of the way Closure is actually working internally. Um, you can reference variables from outside the closure and use them in your function and they'll actually even be shipped to the cluster and stuff like that. So in your program, for example, if you wanted to read the query from the command line and then search for things that contain that query, this will automatically ship that variable across. Um, there are a few things to watch out for here, uh, which is, you know, I just want to state. Um, so first of all, the variables you get on the remote machines are a new copy. So the updates to them don't propagate back to the master. And basically you shouldn't be updating them. You should be uh, sending only things you don't want to modify this way. Uh, the variables have to be serializable, which kind of makes sense if, if we want to ship them across. And um, you shouldn't use fields of an outer object. Or, well, if you do, sometimes you can do it, but that actually ships the whole object because that field access is like is basically um, you know a reference to that object. Um, so uh, let me just show what that looks like because it's a kind of a common um, thing people run into. Um, so if you have you know, it's object my cool application and it has a field parameter that you want to use and another stuff like, another thing like a log file that you don't and you write a closure that uses param, that will actually try to send the whole object, which is generally not what you want. Um, and you'll get an exception, either it will say my cool app is not serializable or even if you mark it as serializable, maybe other stuff inside it like the log file that you opened is not. Um, so that's a problem. And luckily there is an easy way to sort of work around that, um, which is just define a local variable that represents this thing. Um, so uh, in this case, we make param underscore, we just assign it, and then since we're only using a local variable, we don't have to send uh, this along. So this is maybe like the most common mishap people have, so I just wanted to put it up there. Okay. Um, and the, there are a bunch of other things in the API as well. So I, I'm not gonna have time to go through all of them, uh, but I invite you to look at the programming guide. Um, it covers all of these. And finally, let me talk a bit about how jobs execute. Um, okay. So yeah, so we, we saw, you know, we saw a bit of how it works. Uh, just to give you some context of how this all fits together, essentially each Spark application runs uh, the Spark context object acts as the master of your application and that runs inside your application. So unlike something like Hadoop where there's a shared master, you have a separate master for your job and the good thing is like if your master crashes or whatever, it doesn't affect other people's jobs. Um, and that, uh, that Spark context can connect either to Mesos or just run stuff locally in a thread pool. And when it connects to Mesos, it just uses the API to launch a bunch of workers on the other machines. So again, each job is independent. If your worker crashes, you haven't affected someone else's worker. And then these guys, as I mentioned, just use the standard um, you know, Hadoop interfaces to talk to storage. Okay. Um, the scheduler does a bunch of stuff um, inside to optimize your job. Uh, so first of all, it, it looks at the whole graph of operations that you built um, and it, it tries to come up with the plan for the whole thing. It, just, uh, it doesn't just eagerly run each operation. And these graphs can be more than just map reduce. Um, then one of the main optimizations it does is pipelining functions. So here in this picture, each of the big round boxes is an RDD and then these blue things inside it are the partitions of it uh, that might be on different nodes. And um, if uh, we do a map and then a filter, the scheduler s says, okay, well, there's no point saving the result of the map to a file or to memory and then scanning over it again to do the filter. I can just filter each element as it comes out of the map function. And so these things will happen in line uh, in a single task. And basically, at the end, all you get out of it is whatever passed the filter. Um, and uh, the scheduler knows where data is cached, so it, it will cut off computations when it knows the output is available. So here, if we did a group by and cached it, it knows it doesn't have to go back and do this stuff again. Um, and finally, something I'm not really gonna cover today, but I will talk about it in the advanced uh, uh, section, session tomorrow, is um, partitioning. So uh, the, uh, the scheduler also knows how each RDD is partitioned, like if it's hash partitioned or sorted, and it uses that to optimize the plan as well. 
So in this case, for example, this was already hash partition because we did a group by, and it actually knows, okay, I don't need to shuffle it across the network again because it's already hashed. So let me just do the join by shuffling this guy. Um, don't worry if that doesn't make sense. I'll, I'll go into it next time too. Okay. Um, and um, so um, data storage, um, the way these RDDs are stored by default is just as Java objects. And this is good because there, it's as, there's the fastest way to store something on the JVM. Um, and it's just, it basically they'll run at the same speed that a standalone program would. Um, the other thing you can do is you can tell the system to serialize the objects and just store bytes in memory. And the benefit of that is sometimes Java objects are much bigger than the underlying data. Um, like um, if you have a list of integers, uh, you know, an int is four bytes, but a list has usually a pointer per int and it very quickly becomes much larger than four bytes. Um, yeah, was there a question here? Just a question about the join. Yeah. When we do the join, do we take advantage of multiple cores? Yeah, we do. So on each machine, we run as many threads as there are cores on the machine. And uh, we, we can uh, do the join in parallel that way. And yeah, we don't, we don't do anything very fancy with the join. So we, we just have a pretty simple like hash join. Um, so we, it would be cool to do other things, but we don't do it here. Yeah. Uh, question? Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah, that's a great question. So, so the, the components are, okay, <laughs> yeah, for the webcast. The question was how extensible are the components? And so we've designed the system to be uh, very extensible, actually. And there's two ways you can do it. So one way is even at the sort of user level, on top of the operations we provide, there are a few low-level ones that you can use to, for example, do your own join. So for example, in the co-group, uh, co-group gives you, you know, a bunch of, it ju just gives you lists of elements for each key, and then you can do your join inside that however you want. That's a very basic example. Um, and inside the system, it's actually pretty easy to add a new transformation and to specify how it affects the dependency graph. Um, so I'd be glad to talk more about that um, later on, but we, we've done, even in our lab, we're doing a lot of research that's changing aspects of the system um, and, and like for example, trying to get approximators also, stuff like that. Yeah. Another question? With a, have we done anything with Gluster? No, not right, not right now, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Um, okay, so just, uh, yeah. So, so if you want to, to get started with this, uh, you know, before the exercises and stuff, it's actually not too bad to get started. You can find all the instructions at sparkproject.org, but essentially you can clone it from Git and then use this SBT compile. SBT is a Scala build tool that we use. Um, and then you can get the Spark shell um, over here. Um, so that's, that's something just for you to know to go along. Um, and um, if you want more information on this stuff, we'll provide links for that uh, in the, in the um, uh, exercise session as well. Okay. So that, that, was, um, that was how to run Spark by itself. Are there any questions, um, any more questions about this? Um, the, the other thing we have this morning is I have a, a shorter talk on how to do uh, standalone applications. Uh, but let's, let's do this first just so that we don't context switch um, to that. More questions? Yeah, at the back. Do you or run multiple uh, applications that create multiple contexts connecting to the same cluster? Ah, if you have applications that create multiple contexts. Um, so right now in, in, the, in the latest release of Spark, you can't do that. So you shouldn't have two Spark contexts in the same program unless you stop the first one and then start the second one. In the dev branch, you can actually do it. So we want to enable that. Um, but um, it, right, now, right now it's not recommended, yeah. Okay. All right, so yeah, if there are no more questions, I'll just go to um, how to do this in uh, standalone apps as well. Um, and um, hopefully that will give you a good enough idea to be able to start on the exercises this afternoon.
Okay. Um, so this, this is a shorter talk um, that's just gonna be on writing standalone programs. And uh, we're just gonna have um, four pieces here. So we're gonna have how to set up your local machine for Spark development, how to add it to your project. Um, and then we're gonna do one application, which is PageRank. I'll just show you what's involved in that. Um, and we'll do it in uh, both Scala and Java. And then finally, I have a few slides on testing and debugging. Yeah, and again, if there are questions, just let me know. Okay. So building Spark, I showed this before. Um, the, basically, you just need Java and you need to do those commands to run it. Um, to, to run a standalone application, you'll also need to choose one of two uh, paths. So one path is you can package Spark and all of its dependencies into one big jar file and then just add that jar file to the, the class path of your application. This is good when you have a simple application. You don't want to worry about like adding a dependency. Just, just make this one big jar. There's a command sbt assembly to do that. Um, the other thing you can do is you can publish it to the Maven cache on your machine um, using publish local, and then you can add a Maven dependency. Um, so what that looks like is, um, you, you know, if, if you use Maven or a Maven-based build system, you add this group ID, artifact ID, and version of, um, of, um, uh, of Spark, and your project will automatically pull in all the dependencies as well. Um, once you do that, um, the next thing is, is creating your Spark context. So first of all, there are some imports you should have. Just import Spark context and Spark context that underscore are usually the, the only ones you'll need. Um, this underscore here means import all the members, like the static members of the class. And basically, uh, it's important to get some things called implicit conversions in Scala that I don't have time to go into, but they're the things that enable doing new operations on an RDD based on, on its contents. So like if it contains key value pairs, they unlock some new operations. And then to create the Spark context, um, you, create, you give it four arguments. Uh, so you give it um, a cluster URL to connect to, which like for the shell can be local or it can be a host and port. You give it a job name. This will be shown on the UI of the cluster so you can tell which job is which. Um, you give it uh, Spark Home. This is the path where you've installed Spark. So basically it has to be at the same path on all the machines and you just tell it what the path is so that it can find it. Um, and finally, you give it one or more um, jar files containing your code. Um, uh, and the system makes sure to ship these jar files to the cluster. So you don't need to like recompile and distribute the code manually. So that's basically what you have to do. Um, so if you wanna see a, a full Spark program, this is the word count one from before. Um, and there's basically, well, you, there's the imports we had, um, there's this stuff here, which is how you define an application in, um, in uh, Scala. You define a top level object, and then you define a main method in it, um, and it takes an array of strings. Um, and then we create our Spark context, we create a file, and we do this stuff. Here we're saving it out to a text file. So that's kind of what it is. Okay. Uh, no, so, so you need to deploy Spark to the slaves. The question was, does it deploy itself? It doesn't right now. Um, that's the thing we, we want to do in the future, though. Yeah. Are there questions? Yeah, for, to run on a cluster right now, you need to install Mesos first. So that's actually the distributed thing you install. And then we just connect to that, and it tells us where all the machines are. Yeah. Are there questions? Yeah, yeah, so this, yeah, is the main aesthetic function, yeah. So basically, the, the way Scala works is um, the, this, this thing called object is um, kind of a, a static singleton object. So um, this is how you define the static part of a class in Scala. Um, Scala uh, kind of simplifies the language by not having static and non-static members in the same class. Um, you can find a bit about this online. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of what it is. So that's maybe a little um, uh, anticlimactic because that, that's what it is. But so, so let's, let's just go through it and, and try to do uh, one interesting algorithm as a standalone app, uh, which is gonna be PageRank. Um, so I'm gonna explain that first and, and then we'll, we'll see what it looks like. It's not a ton of code, but it's a bit more interesting than word count. Okay, 
So why, why are we doing page rank? There's two reasons I chose it. One is that it's a good example of a more complex analytics algorithm that you want to run. Like as soon as you get a bunch of interesting data, uh, you know, in an HDFS cluster, you know, at first maybe you're doing counts and sums and stuff on the data, but quickly you want to run more interesting applications. And PageRank, if you run it with MapReduce, you can definitely do it, but it's a lot of MapReduce steps and it's a fairly complicated application to write. Uh, the other advantage is it benefits from in-memory caching. So it follows this pattern of iterating over the data that a lot of uh, analytics algorithms do, where you run many map reduces over the same data. And so by caching the data, we can go significantly faster. Okay, so what, what does PageRank mean? Um, so in PageRank, the idea is that we have a bunch of documents and we want to give them scores called the PageRank based on the link structure pointing to them. So the idea is if you have a page that a lot of other pages link to, like say CNN.com, uh, you give it a high rank. But also if there's a high rank page that's pointing to some other page, you know, maybe CNN.com has a news article about some, you know, some new uh, website or something like that, um, that means that other page is also important, so you give that a higher rank as well. And so if you see here, you know, these smiley faces are the pages and uh, the blue one, for example, has a lot of little guys pointing to it, so it gets a bigger rank. The yellow one here has a bunch of high rank people pointing to it, so it also gets a big rank. And because it's pointing to this, this gets a big rank as well. Okay, so how, how does it work? Um, essentially, um, you do this this step-by-step uh, -step process, you just repeat this process. So you start each page at a rank of one, and on each iteration, you take the page's rank and you split it among its neighbors and this is called the contributions. So you, for page P, you split it among its number of neighbors and you send it along. And then at the end, you update each page's rank to this formula, which is you know, 0.15 plus 0.85 times the contributions. Um, and what this is meant, is meant to do is it's meant to eventually converge to like the, the probability that a, you know, a surfer who starts at a random web page ends up on this page. So there's some mathematical reason why you wanna do this. Um, so here's what we would do in this case. We have four pages and uh, we start by splitting up the, the ranks and passing them along to the neighbors. So this one, for example, has one neighbor, so it passes a one over there. This one has two neighbors, so it passes 0.5 to each of them. And you do this for all of them. So now once you've done that, you go ahead and you update the scores. Um, let's just look at one of them, for example. So this guy over here, he receives a one, um, and so when you plug it in here, you get 0.15 plus 0.85 times one, so his new rank will be one. Um, if you look at the other ones, this, this one only receives 0.5, this one only receives 0.5, and the one at the top receives more. Um, and so basically, you end up with, um, with the numbers here. Uh, so the one at the top has received a higher rank. Now you run the next step of, of the algorithm. You take these values and you split them up again among the edges. Um, and so here, for example, this guy has a smaller value, so he splits only 0.29, um, and you pass those along. And you go ahead, you add them up, and you get something else. And if you keep running this for a bunch of steps, um, usually you'd probably want at least 10 to 20 steps, you end up uh, with a final state that is now stable, where if you do this operation again, you end up in the same state again. Um, so that's, that's the state for this one. So how do we implement this in Spark? Um, you can actually implement this using the operations we've seen um, so far, and especially using the join. Um, so here's uh, the, the, the body of the Spark code for this. Basically, the way we'll do it is we'll have two RDDs. One of them um, contains key value pairs with the URL and a list of neighbors. And the second one contains key value pairs with a URL and its current page rank, okay? Um, and then you'll have these iterations, and on each iteration, we first calculate the contributions. So we do that by joining these guys so that we get the, the neighbors and the rank for each URL together into one, um, you know, into one tuple. Um, and then we use flat map to produce the maybe multiple contributions that this guy will create, okay? So what we're doing here, this, this case is just letting us pattern match on, on the argument. So it just says, okay, our argument, we expect it to be a tuple with a URL and then links and a rank inside that. Um, that's what this does. 
And then as a result, we have to return the contributions. And basically for each link we have, we take its destination. And for that destination, we divide our rank by the total number of neighbors. So that's, uh, that's what that does. Um, and now we have the contributions. Now we use reduce by key to sum up the contributions for each URL. And we do this map values to actually get the final value. Any questions about this? Or is this uh, fairly clear? So this is, this is done uh, actually on the algorithm. And you just run a bunch of iterations and then save it to a file. Um, the other thing I guess I, I forgot to show here is you probably want to cache links in, to, in memory so that uh, you don't have to go back to disk each time you read the links data set. Uh, because if, if you notice, it's always joining against the same links data set. OK. Um, so let's see what this looks like. Um, I'm going to just show you uh, the actual code. I'm not going to actually implement it. Um, but uh, so that you can see. Um, this is on a different EC2 machine that I have. OK, so yeah, on this machine I have, uh, which one am I in right now? Uh, I have a bunch of them, but let, let me show you the Scala one first. So I, I created this little project with a page rank dot Scala. Um, I used SBT, the simple build tool, but you don't need to know how to use that. And I just have a, a oops, I just have one file, page rank dot Scala. Um, and um, in a different window here, uh, let's look at, at, at our input data. So I created a graph file um, and basically, I set up this program so that the input format is, you know, for each page its name and then a link of a list of neighbors. If you wanted, you could have like, you can, without too much code, you could do an actual HTML page and pull out the links using a, a map and a filter. But that's what I did. Um, so this, this graph here actually is exactly the same one I have down here, where basically, um, so the, the top page, for example, links to the right one, the right one links to top and bottom, uh, you know, left links to top and so on. So that's the, the same graph. So what does it look like? Um, it's a pretty short program. It's about 40 lines of code. Um, what you have is first you have a class to represent the pages. We're gonna have a title and an array of links. It's pretty easy. Um, and then we have our main object. And here I just put two functions. I put parse page, which turns each um, input line from the file into a page object. And then I have main. Um, so in parse page, we're using some of the functional stuff we saw before. Basically, we split it. Um, we, we split the line using a regular expression, so along colons and commas. And then piece zero is the title, and the links are the tail of the array. The tail is everything but the first element. And we're actually going to trim them because there are spaces around them. So that's, that's pretty easy. Um, the second thing uh, in main, let's just see if we can fit that, yeah. Um, so in main, um, we, um, we figure out some command line arguments. So we're going to give this guy a URL, an input file, and a number of iterations. Um, we figure out, um, we, I've hard coded here where Spark is installed and where the jar file is, but most likely you'd want to take these from the command line or from a config file as well. Um, and then we create the Spark context. And then we have basically the code below. So we load pages as a text file. We create the links and ranks as key value pairs by mapping this thing. Um, and um, finally, we do this join and then reduce by key inside. And then at the end, I'm just going to print the rank for each page um, on the command line. Um, and this final thing is to actually stop Spark and disconnect from the cluster. OK, so let's see what, what it's like to run this thing. Uh, so first I'm going to package it into a jar, which is a thing in the build system. You can build the, the project into a jar. Actually, I guess it already created it. Uh, sorry. Yeah, if you look at here, Scala291, it created this jar file, the page rank that jar. And then to run it, I'm going to use uh, SBT run. Um, and to actually run a thing in SBT, you need to put the command line arguments in quotes. So that's just kind of a quirk of the system. But um, I'm just going to run it, and I'm going to pass it the master. I'm going to use local right now um, and graph that text. Oops. And um, the number of, um, um, of iterations. And let's just run it for one iteration, for example. And so it's going to go ahead. 
um, and on it. And this is actually, this is the result after the first iteration, if you remember, where the top guy got 1.85 and you know, all this stuff happened. And if I run it for 10 iterations, for example, it'll go and give me the, the final result. Yeah, and this is what I had in the slide as well. Uh, because I predicted by hunting this, so <laughs> it's, it's gonna match. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> okay. And just to show you how to run it on a cluster, um, um, this is, um, so host name 5050, I'm running the Mesos master on this host, and I put this file in HDFS, and I'm gonna run it for five iterations. So this will take a while, so I'm not actually gonna go back and look at it, but you just pass these, and now that jar that we built before will be shipped to the cluster. Um, show you a little bit of what it looks like when it's running. Uh, let me go see. Um, is this the cluster I want? Yeah, let's, let's see if this is it. Yeah, so this is that cluster. This is the Mesos web UI, and here you can monitor your job so you can see it's an application called PageRank, it's running, and it has a bunch of tasks that are running on these different machines. So that's kind of what it looks like. And actually, if, if you go through this guy, um, if it's still running, you can click through and, um, well, whatever. You can, you can see all the stuff there is. I think it's actually finished now. Oh no, I guess it's still there. You can also see like the log files that is, it's creating um, all kinds of stuff like that. Okay, so this was, uh, this was PageRank in Java. Um, hopefully it makes uh, some sense. Um, let's uh, see the same thing in Java as well. Oh, okay, I, I guess one last thing I should say is how does it actually perform? Like, did we gain anything from using Spark? It's kind of an important question. Um, so uh, we, we tried running this with uh, a very similar program, uh, but on more data. This was on actually all of Wikipedia. And when you compare it with Hadoop, it goes about two or three times um, faster, depending on the size of the cluster and other stuff like that. And the speed up is mostly from keeping the links uh, data set in memory uh, using cache. So it actually does gain some speed up. Um, but the other point I wanna get across is like, this is a thing that applies to many algorithms and for other algorithms, the speed up can be substantially bigger. Um, so for example, in this afternoon, you'll see uh, uh, classification and clustering, which are two machine learning algorithms and in logistic regression classification, for example, you can go about 30 times faster in uh, k-means clustering, this is going about three times faster as well. So depending on the algorithm, the IO is often a bottleneck and, and being able to cache this stuff helps. Okay. And for the page rank in Java, um, let me just give a, a quick overview of uh, the this, this stuff we'll be seeing there. Um, so the, the main difference here is that in the Java API, we don't have functions as a first class thing in the language. Um, so instead we're gonna be extending these function objects and they're all in this uh, package called spark.api.java. And um, to, to use these, we use a s s special um, type of RDD, like th uh, which is called Java RDD, which has the same methods as the Scala ones, but takes these Java functions. And finally, to do the key value pair operations, we have to use some special pair functions and pair RDDs to actually get the type safety because uh, we, we wanna make sure you can only call those operations on a thing that actually contains key value pairs. So here's what some code looks like in, in Java. Um, this one here is just counting the total number of words in a file. Um, so you, you have a different set of imports to import the Java API, but you create a Java Spark context in the same way you do a Scala one. Um, you can create a text file, and then you can do, for example, for flat map, you extend this thing called flat map function that returns an iterable of um, strings. So you, you call this, on, say, in this case, on each line of text, and you split each string. Um, and for other things like count, you know, it's the exact same method name. And that's, that's in a nutshell what you do. Um, as a practical sort of man, matter, um, it can get unwieldy to write a lot of these things in line in this style, you know, depending on the program. So you can also just define a class that extends function and pass that into there. Um, and you can, this way you can split up your program. It, it'll be more, you know, it'll split, be split into more little classes, but the, the core of it will be a bit shorter and easier to read. Okay. 
And for key value pairs, um, you have to use, uh, if you wanna create an RDD of key value pairs, you have to use this pair function. And you get back this Java pair RDD instead of just Java RDD. Um, so essentially, this one it works the same way, but now Spark will know that this RDD contains key value pairs, and it gives you some of the key value pair operations. Um, so for example, if we wanted to do reduce by key, um, that you can only do that on a pair RDD. You can't do that on a regular one. So that's, that's kind of what it is. Um, any questions about that? Or, yeah. Okay. Um, and just to look at the Java page rank, I have the code on the same machine. Um, and I just loaded in Java. So this is, you know, the main point of this is to let you see a, co a complete program um, in Java. So um, we'll be working in the program with some lists. We'll be working with Scala tuples. So you can just import the class tuple2 and create them from inside Java. Um, and we'll be working with the Spark stuff. Um, and like before, I made a class to represent the page. Had to do a bit more uh, work to do that, but it's the same kind of thing. And we have a main that looks um, really quite similar. Um, so uh, that's just, you know, setting up the, the context is the same as before. Let's just look at some of the, the uh, ways you can pass functions. So in this one here, we're taking a text file um, and we're, sorry, we're, we're mapping it and we just passed this parse page object. Um, so I created a class parse page that it implements that function. Um, in this one here, I actually put the function in line. So here I'm, I'm taking, you know, the, the pages and I'm pulling out the, uh, the, the title and the links. And here there's a similar one. And then for our iterations, I chose to, I, I do the same join and flat map, but I chose to pass in these objects instead. Okay, and really like at the end, you know, stuff like collect gives you back a Java list. Uh, you can print them out, you can access the, the elements with underscore one and underscore two. So it's really the, the same kind of things you do in Scala. You can take a Scala program and very mechanically convert it to Java if you'd like to. Um, and just to give you a sense of, at the bottom I have a bunch of these other um, functions that extend this. Um, and you know, in terms of code, it's actually, this is about 90 or 100 lines of code. The Scala one was 40 lines. So there is some, some extra space usage, but it's also not terrible. I mean, if you've tried using, writing this kind of thing in Hadoop, I, I don't know if people have tried, but it's generally a lot more work than this to do it, especially because stuff like join isn't provided for you out of the box. So it's still a useful thing to use even uh, with the Java API. Yeah, performance-wise, it's the same. It's the same performance. Yeah, same engine. Cool. Okay, so just one last thing before we, we go for lunch, which is testing and debugging. So, you know, you, you'll write this stuff, and um, there will definitely be no bugs in Spark itself and stuff like that, but <laughs> sometimes you'll be programming so quickly that you'll make a mistake. So what, what will happen? Um, so let's see. So first of all, um, for developing, I really recommend like developing in local mode first. You can even make it multi-threaded, so you can run on a decent amount of data. Um, and the Spark's <laughs> local mode is designed to actually emulate a cluster as closely as possible. So for example, even though we're running in the same JVM, we'll still serialize all the data, we'll serialize all the tasks to catch things that are not serializable. And the goal here is to make you, ca make you see the same errors you would on a cluster in local mode. But the cool thing with local mode is you can just use your existing Java or Scala debugger to debug it. You can set breakpoints, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, if you want to run on a cluster, um, you can, you have a few options. So you can set up a Mesos cluster yourself. And uh, I, I think we, we may have a little bit on this uh, in tomorrow's talk, but I'm not going to go into detail on how to do that. Essentially, you have to just compile Mesos and set some config files uh, and launch it on each machine. Um, but the other way to test stuff really quickly on a cluster is using EC2. Um, and um, we provide the script Spark EC2 that makes it very simple to launch a cluster. Um, essentially, you just tell the script your EC2 key pair and like your private key to log into the nodes and how many nodes you want. And uh, you can create a cluster, you can like pause and resume a cluster, you can stop it and so on. 
So this is a very straightforward way to, uh, to actually try this out on a cluster. And this is actually what we'll be using this afternoon. We've launched the clusters for you, but you'll get, you know, you'll get the stuff that was created by this. Um, when you're running on Mesos, um, you'll want maybe to look at the log files. Um, so there are two ways. The first way is to look at the Mesos UI, and I showed you that before. Basically, if you follow the links into each task, you get a pointer to um, its standard output and standard error files. So you can use that and, um, and debug stuff by printing stuff in there. Um, these logs are also saved, they're saved in what's called the Mesos work directory. By default, it saves them in slash temp. And you'll see in there, it's kind of a long path. Each slave has its own folder, and each framework that is an application has its own application ID. Um, and you get eventually the standard output and standard error. So this is, this is how you can find them. Um, and um, let's just see what some, some common uh, uh, issues are that you might spot in there. Um, so if you have a task that crashes using an exception, we'll actually report that back to the master. So you'll see the output in the master's log. Uh, you don't have to go all the way to the slave node to see it. And basically the thing to look for there is this lost PID, um, or lost task ID one, um, and then it says why it was lost. So um, here, you know, I just wrote a job that divided by zero. Um, the other kind of loss you'll see is what's called a fetch failure. This sometimes confuses people. So fetch failure just means that machine couldn't communicate with another machine, usually to fetch the output of a map task. And most likely that means that the machine it couldn't communicate with has crashed. And it probably crashed because of an exception that happened earlier, or just because of, you know, um, maybe machine running out of uh, memory or whatever, whatever reason it, it might crash for. Um, so when you see this, I, you should always look for the first problem in the log because there's usually something else that caused it to get into this, um, into this condition. Um, and the, the final thing you, you may run into is the uh, infamous, you know, not serializable exception. I've hinted at a few times before. Um, so uh, this, uh, th this is a thing you can, so Java actually tells you which class was not serializable, but maybe a thing that's less well known is you can ask it to give you a detailed trace of where that thing uh, came in from your object. So you know, if you have an object and in it there's a list and in the list there are some other classes and like the field of one of those is not serializable, this will actually tell you, okay, you know, I followed field uh, you know, field, the field called log file of this class, and it wasn't serializable. Um, and you can do that by setting the system property. So you can use either system.set property in Java, or you can pass it on the command line. In Spark, you can pass it through this environment variable, Spark Java options. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so system properties, uh, system properties shipped to the cluster. Um, the, any property starting with Spark is shipped. Actually, this one is not shipped, but you can set it in, um, in the Spark env.sh. There's a config file where you can set it. We should probably ship this one too, though. I, we might even be doing that in the dev branch because I've thought about it a few times. But yeah, today it's not. Yeah. Okay. Um, and finally, the, as I mentioned earlier, the most common cause of this is you're accidentally pulling in an outer object that you didn't expect. So just beware of that. Uh, if you want to define a function outside, define it as a static function in a, in a singleton object. Yeah. Uh, would you find this only when the partitioning causes distribution? So actually, you'll see this even in local mode because we try to serialize every task even if we're gonna run it on the same machine. Um, so you should, I, I don't think there are cases where you see this on a cluster but you don't see it in local mode. Yeah. Okay, so that's, you know, th these are kind of the things you might, uh, you might wanna look at. Um, so, so that's, that's um, um, all I wanted to show about this. Um, the final thing is, you know, for, for more help, there's also a pretty active user community, a pretty helpful mailing list. So if you wanna sign up for the mailing list, it's on Google Groups. It's also linked from the Spark homepage. And if you're in the Bay Area, you can also come to the meetup and you can meet people, um, other people that are using Spark over there. Um, so that's it, I think uh, it's, uh, it's time um, for lunch unless there are any further questions.